what culture my name is Simon Miller and before we begin I just want to look down this camera lens into your eyes and into your heart and say thank you very much for watching this ups and downs for Triple H's career and isn't that fun we're taking the ups and downs format that we do for Raw we do the Smackdown we do the pay-per-views and we're applying it we're pasting onto WWE wrestlers lives what they've done within the whole of the industry i just think that's a delightful little bobby now we've done some for kane we've done some for the undertaker and we've done some for edge and someone in the comments made a very good point they said simon shouldn't you really do these in chronological order so we can enjoy someone's career from start to finish you were right my friend so that's what we're going to do right now as we up those downs for triple h's career So we will go right back in time to when Paul Levesque did indeed start his life in pro wrestling, as we talked about in the intro. And yeah, we'll throw a down on that down counter because when he did arrive, he was known as Terror Rising. And that's right, terrorizing like terrorizing. I know it sounds like I'm just saying the same stuff, but I'm not. Go and Google it and look it up. The stupidest part about this name is that at one time in WCW, somebody looked at it and went, well, we should change the spelling. So they didn't think the name was dumb. They thought it came down to the lettering. You gotta be kidding me. Debuting in 1994 against Keith Cole, eventually World Championship Wrestling saw sense, and instead they came up with the idea of kind of playing off Paul Levesque's real name and calling him John Paul Levesque. The problem there is that somebody back said, said to John Paul, hey, why don't you go out there and talk in a French accent? The man didn't speak French, nor did he have a French accent. Even with these ridiculous beginnings, everybody could see the potential that was there, including one William Regal, who did tag with the man back in the mid-90s. But none of this lasted that long, because in 1995, he jumped ship to the then WWF. Unfortunately, that is another down, though, because Vince McMahon went and made the exact same mistake as his competitor and turned the soon-to-be Triple H into the blue blood. Down. Now it's fair to say that this just was the WWE back in the mid 90s. Everybody had a stupid gimmick, including Duke the Dumpster Drozzy, who I'm pretty sure was meant to be the guy that came and changed your bins once a week. And interestingly, given that we are talking about Hunter Hearst Helmsley, those two had a little feud when he first arrived in the company. Trivia. It was all based on rich, posh people that the man himself said he hated. And that was that. That's how, that's how shallow that gimmick was. I don't like these people. You go out there and you mimic them and I'll get a kick of it back here in the gorilla position. Do a little bow. Do a little bow. You go like that. Put a little flower in your head. It will drive people nuts. Anyone with a pair of eyes could have seen that this gimmick had a very definitive ceiling. And then we had all the fallout from the curtain call incident and Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. They were headed to World Championship Wrestling. Shawn Michaels was the champ. So all the heat fell down on Triple H. And for a while he just fought in hog matches against, was it Henry O'Godwin or the other one? All I remember is they were called Hog and Pig when you took their initials and that was just ridiculous. But there, that's pretty much the end of that. Didn't really work. He needed more, which is exactly what he got in 1997 when he did team with his real life mate Shawn Michaels. They formed DX and of course, that gets a big old up. Today, watching some of their antics is a little bit eyebrow raising, but you can't judge the past based on the present. And let's face it, these two were so popular that they're still getting cheers today because they recently reformed. That's a sign you did something right and they caught the audience at a time when pro wrestling was changing. Pretty much being a segue act for the Attitude Era, China, Triple H, Shawn Michaels and Rick Rude captured lightning in a bottle. And this more realistic version of Trips was just so much easier to believe, mostly because he was just running around like a goofball being a massive moron, which is what I presume that he did when the cameras were off him too. It was the gateway to his future success. That's why we gave it an up. That's the whole concept of ups and downs. And he gets another up for everything that happened post WrestleMania 14. With Shawn Michaels out for an indefinite period of time, he took the reins of Degeneration X, he revamped it, he made it its own, and arguably made it more popular than it ever was before. Gets it up. It not only lifted him higher, but it also helped Billy Gunn and the Road Dog, who became the New Age Outlaws, 
and it helped the returning X-Pac. There's no denying that throughout 1998, these four dudes were among the most popular on the entire roster. When you think of the Attitude Era, you think of DX. And it has been overplayed today, but without this group, we never would have got that awesome segment when, yes, they headed over to WCW and tried to invade. That was like breaking the fourth wall. It was interesting, it was cool. It was also during his time that he started his first feud with The Rock, and they had that match at SummerSlam 98 for the Intercontinental Championship. And sure, it's not as good today as it was 20 years ago, but it's still damn good. And it's even more interesting when you do watch it in 2018, knowing the paths these two men were about to take. It probably could have gone on a little longer than it did too, but in 1999, Triple H looked at his future, decided what path he wanted to take, changed gears, and became a massive heel. That's getting up too. He turned his back on the group and joined the corporation. And while that in itself wasn't anything amazing, it did lead to him secretly marrying Stephanie McMahon. And never forget, before we realized that Steph and him were in cahoots, the WWE storyline was man drugs woman and secretly weds her. Wrestling everybody, go tell your friends and family to watch. It all worked though, because not only did they make a great pair, for some reason, they just had great chemistry. It also allowed Triple H to take huge steps up the ladder. He changed his music. He got massively jacked. He became the game. And he also became a guy that if someone had come up to you and said, hey, draw a wrestler down on paper, you probably would have sketched out a drawing of Triple H. His in-ring work continued to get better. He won the world championship. And he overcame all the questions about, hmm, I'm not sure this guy actually deserves to be in the main event by proving he should be in the main event. And yes, he owes Mick Foley a huge debt because of that. It can't be overstated how much the former Mankind did help Triple H in the 2000s. And you should go and watch their match at the Royal Rumble 2000. It's a brawl that even now you will not believe. It was also when he teamed with Stone Cold Steve Austin to form the two-man power trip. And that still makes me laugh because it was absolutely nuts. And then, of course, his career... A massive road stop. Which naturally brings us to a down because we do have to talk about his quad injury. In fact, it's not only a down, the brown down. Suffering it during a brilliant tag match in May 2001, all you need to know is that Triple H tore this muscle right off the bone. And that is so bad, when he was telling the trainers on the way to the back, I think I tore my quad, the trainer said, there is no way that's possible, but it was. Keeping him out of action until January 2002 is quite funny, really, because not only does that return get it up, but can you believe it? It gets the gold and up. Why? Well, it's not really something I feel I can do justice in words. It's another moment you should go and check out. But when he did return in Madison Square Garden in January of that year, it was just absolutely incredible. The evasion he got was so light, it was like we were all a part of it because it made you feel so damned emotional. It absolutely established Triple H as a massive baby face and while his program with Chris Jericho at WrestleMania was mediocre at best and then he lost that championship to Hulk Hogan in a bizarre set of circumstances, this moment, what I'm talking about right now, 16 years later, is still it's just special. They already said that. I'll say it again. It's just special. However, soon after this, we get to that time period and well, down. As well as that whole debacle with Kane and Katie Vick, and you can just go and watch Ups and Downs for the Big Red Machine to get my take on it on how bad it all was, it was also during this time when Raw and SmackDown had separate world champions after the brand split. Apparently though, WWE didn't have any good ideas. I know we could have done a tournament for a Raw champion, but we did not. Then Raw GM, Eric Bischoff, just walked to the ring. He opened a briefcase. He went, come out, Triple H. He did. He went, there you go. There's a title. Boom, that was that. On the one hand, it did work because it made Triple H an asshole, especially because he celebrated like he had beaten the entire roster. But given that he did celebrate that way, why didn't we give him the opportunity to beat the entire roster? Like I say, do a tournament, do anything. Just let me invest or put something into the fact that someone's going to become a world champion other than this. That was it. New champ. Another down as well because in the years after this, he became puffy hair Triple H. And really, that's when a lot of fans turned on him, so yeah, down. There was all that nonsense with Booker T at WrestleMania, which is still a travesty to this day. It absolutely should have gone in the other direction. That feud with Vladimir Kozlov and the constant rumor and mumblings that he was holding everybody down backstage. It wasn't the best time and countless wrestlers have come out to verify this. Just go and watch any interview with somebody known as Rob Van Dam. We switch back to two very cool things that did happen during this period, though, and I feel like they deserve their own shout outs. So yeah, they just get one big up. The first, of course, comes when he tangled with the returning Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam 2002. That was badass. Something else you should go re-watch as soon as you're done with this ups and downs video. It's also got the emotional edge to it, because every time HB take a bump, 
you think your brain may explode because you're worried about his health. But still, what a war. The other would be evolution and how that all imploded with the turn of Batista. Much like Foley had done with Triple H years earlier, Triple H decided that he would return the favor when it came to Big Dave and he put him over in the best possible way, including losing the championship to him at WrestleMania 21. People went wild in February 2005 on Raw when Batista gave Triple H the big thumb down and the game himself deserves all the credit in the world for what he did here. He helped no end. Which brings us to the most recent incarnation of Triple H, and let's face it, on many ways, could be the best one yet. Not only the successor to the throne, but underlying his credentials for everything he's done with NXT, business suit Triple H has also been responsible for going out there, getting many of our favorite indie stars, and bringing them into the WWE. And at one point in the past, that was never gonna happen. His weekly promotion also mostly delivers more than it fails, and yeah, there have been a few blips, a few obstacles along the way. I mean, everything that happened with Roman Reigns at WrestleMania and the year prior with Sting at WrestleMania. I'm just going to shrug my shoulders at that one. You know, whew, what are you going to do? In short, I'm just a big fan of New Age, which is what I'm going to call him. And that makes me an idiot. And also, given that I know I haven't you know, touched on everything that Triple H did in his career, make sure you leave a comment below and talk about the rest of them. And I'm going to do that here. This is my verbal comment because he gets a secret up. Don't have to put a number or anything. But he gets a secret up for that time he called Kofi Kingston out for just losing his Jamaican accent. I know there was a lot of problems there, because, you know, WWE storytelling at times can be stupid, but it made me laugh then. It still makes me laugh now. I covered the mic. It still makes me laugh now. Also, as I am doing a video about Triple H's career, I'll also say this. He was one of the dudes that made me love pro wrestling. He was the dude that got me into lifting weights. And he's a personal hero of mine. So what are you going to do? Nothing. I've already said it. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below, as I just said, letting us know your favorite and worst moments of Triple H's career. Like, share, and subscribe. Head over to whatculture.com and read yourself some articles. And follow What Culture on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thanks for watching this special edition of Ups and Downs. And again, just in case somehow Triple H ever watches this, which he won't, because why would he? Thank you so much for all the years of entertainment and for inspiring me from my very gut. I don't think. I'd be the person I was today if I hadn't stumbled across you about 20 or so years ago. And that, my friends, is damn cool. I'll see you soon.